All right. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's good to see you out there today. I'm Pastor Dave. Most of you know that. Maybe you're a guest. Thanks for being here with us today. And man, I saw the sun come out there between services, and that was like, wow, that's awesome. It's going to mess with my nap today, though, I'll tell you that. Hey, I'm glad you're here. We, uh, we finished up a series last week called Orange, and that's the student ministry and children's ministry curriculum. But we're starting something new today, starting a new series. I wanted to spend about three weeks in this series because I feel like we need uh, to be um, reminded, and some of us may be educated for the first time, on this thing called uh, the gospel, as you can see uh, by the background image there. The gospel. Now, the gospel, we'll talk about it in a minute, but as you might know, it means good news. And I'll tell you why in a minute. I'll tell you why it means that. But we, we hear so much bad news in our world today, don't we? I mean, there's so much. Yesterday, the, the mass shooting in Pittsburgh was just horrendous. I mean, it is happening. So much is happening in our world that is so bad, so negative, and it just fills our news screens, our TV screens, our uh, iPad, iPhone screens, it is so bad. But, you know, there's a, there's a way to get good news. There's apps out there uh, where you can get good news. For instance, I have an app called uh, the Good News Network. And I, I wanted to give you some good news. In the, in the face of so much bad news, because there's a lot of bad news in the world, but there's good news too. We don't need to overlook it. There's good news happening right there in your life, in your family. But here's some good news. Kindergartners sign... Happy birthday for hard of hearing custodian. Did you see that? that? That was in the news this week. Woman locates her family years after being left on doorstep. That was a good news headline this week. South Carolina cop tosses football with boy after noticing he was playing alone. Well, that's good news, isn't it? That's so good. City to build park inspired by girl with cerebral palsy. That's good news. Mom, son, celebrate 30 years since historic kidney donation. More good news. Terminally ill boy sworn in as honorary cop follows in dad's footsteps. And, uh, you know, you can use your phone and you can use the uh, internet and computer in a lot of different ways. I suggest you get one of these apps uh, you just type in good news in your uh, search finder and find something where you can be reminded of good things. I have local news uh, channels, apps, and, and I'm always getting notified, you know, because I allow them. I allow them to come up on my screen. You can choose that, just like you allow gateway notifications. If you have our gateway app, and hopefully you do, then you get notified, not necessarily about news, but about events coming up or something to pray about. So if you don't have our church app, um, get the church app and, and let it go to notifications and tell it. But I get the news apps, local news apps, uh, notifications, and there are about 99% bad stuff that's happening in our area. Shootings. Uh, stabbings, uh, drug overdoses, I and mean, we can just go down the list. Terrible things that are happening, things just not so good. We need some good news, don't we, in our life. We need good news in our life. And, and the church is that place of good news. And you, as a, um, perhaps you're a Christian, I hope you are. If you're not, I hope by the end of the service you'll decide to become one. But by nature of being a follower of Christ and a member, a representative of the church, we carry with us all the time good news. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about good news. Now, there are people who reject the term evangelical. This term evangelical is a word. It's kind of a, uh, a word that's tr what's called transliterated from one language to the other. A transliteration is a word that sounds in one language sounds the same in another language. And they've done that with this word, and they do that with a lot of words. And this word comes from the same Greek word from which we get the word gospel or good news. But a lot of people, they don't, even Christians, even those who are called evangelical Christians, and by the way, if you're a part of this church, you are an evangelical Christian. That simply means that you believe, you're in a church that believes, we ought to be sharing the gospel we ought to be 
talking to other people about the gospel. This is called evangelism. Used to be a word we talked about a lot. We don't throw that word out a whole lot because we are in an age where half of Christians are afraid to evangelize because they don't want to come across pushy or like they're forcing someone to accept or listen to their religious beliefs, their faith. We live in that age where we're so afraid to talk about our faith in the public arena at our jobs or uh, jobs or schools or pray in public or do anything like that. We live in that kind of an age that we're afraid we're going to get sued or somebody's going to be offended and likely somebody will be offended. I mean, you can't even turn around without somebody being offended today, can you? Uh, and especially if you're on social media, you just can't do anything. Somebody's going to take it the wrong way. So this word evangelical is not a twisting of the arm. I don't believe in twisting anybody's arms to do anything of faith. I don't believe God is twisting any arms. Matter of fact, when you hear the gospel, he allows you to say yes or to say no. And we can point to places in Scripture where that happened. People came to Jesus with a question or they some curiosity with some inquisitive, uh, inquisitive uh, search or something, and, and he said, here's what it is, and they, they walked away. They turned around. Read John, one of the saddest verses in the Bible, and I don't know how it ended up this way, but it's John 6, 66. I don't know why it's that verse. You can check it out for yourself. But this verse, it's amazing, it has 66 verses, but this verse says that many of his disciples uh, deserted him. They turned and, and walked away. Because his teaching was so hard, they thought. Oh, we can't accept this. And that's the way it is today. There are a lot of people turning around, even those who are Christians. But I want to tell you, we don't believe in a twisting of the arms either. This word evangelical comes from a word, just like the word gospel comes from the same word in Greek. I'm going to teach you a little Greek today. Is that Okay. You're going to learn a little Greek today. It's not, not too much, because I don't know too much, but I want to teach you a little bit. This Greek word is euangelion. Say that with me. Euangelion. Just like it looks. Just like it looks. We're hooked on Greek phonics. And uh, you, can see, you can see I've separated the word a little bit. I put a hyphen in there to show you that it's almost like a compound word. The U, E-U, is a, a, uh, you know, it's a prefix that you and I are familiar with. We're familiar with this phrase, uh, this prefix. It means good. It means good. We have words in the English language that start with the letters E-U, like euphoria. Euphoria is a, a state of well-being. You feel good. It's euphoric. Or euphemism. I like that word. I love words that start with E-U. It just feels good to say them. Euphemism. A euphemism is a good way to say something bad. For instance, you might say he died, or a better way to say that is he, he passed away, or he expired. Or eulogy, eulogy. You've heard this word, speaking of passing away. At a funeral, a time of grief, we say a good word. That word is from you and logia, or logos, the word for word. We say a good word about the deceased. Or I like the word euphony. Or euphonious. The band this morning was euphonious. I know you don't use that word a lot, but I thought I'd teach you a new word too. Euphonious means it sounded good. It sounded so good. Or I love the word eureka. Eureka in the English language is always followed by an exclamation point. Did you know that? And if it's not, it's not correct. And the reason is, it's like, wow, we found something good out of nowhere. Eureka, we made a discovery. Eureka! And that's what we have, and that's who we are as Christians. We're Eureka! We're, look, we found something so good, we want to share it with you. So the word angelion comes from the word for angel, angelos, and that's kind of a hard G instead of angel. It's angelos or angelion. And so the word euangelion means good, a good word. Or a good message. That's what angels were. They were messengers. Or as we like to say it, good news. We have good news. The angels in the early parts of the Gospels uh, spoke good news. In Luke chapter 2 verse 10, the angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. John uh, the baptizer in Luke chapter 3 said, uh, hey, I'm here to 
talked about good news. I want to tell you the good news to all the people. And what was this good news? What was the good news that the angel was talking about? What was the good news that John was talking about? Well, you know, because we live on this side of history, Jesus is coming. The long-awaited Messiah, the Deliverer, our Rescuer, he's coming. He's here. He's here right now. In Acts chapter 5, verse 42, Luke tells us that the apostles, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped preaching and teaching the good news. Why? Because it was so good. People had lived, Isaiah, I don't have this passage up, but the writer of Isaiah, the prophet, said people were living in gloom. They were living in darkness. They were living with no hope. They were living with just, what is life? We're just going to live and die in nothing. But Jesus came and said, hey, I got good news. This life is not all there is. There's something after death. It's called the afterlife. And you can go with me. You can be there with me. I went before, and I made a way. I died, and I came back to life, and I'm going to do the same for you if you'll follow me. That's good news. And I'll tell you when it's the best news is when there's somebody in your life that you're standing over a coffin or some casket where somebody you love is lying there, and then you're going to be thinking, wow, she's gone. Will I ever see her again? I got good news. If she and you are followers of Christ, yes, you'll see them again. You'll see them again. The Apostle Paul came along in, uh, in the book of Acts when the disciples were teaching this every day. The man by the name of Saul tried to stop them. He was stopping them. And then he had this miraculous conversion on the road to Damascus. And the Bible says he took hold of this gospel so much, he really spread it more so than any other first century disciple. And he said he considered his life worth nothing, that only his aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given him to the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. He actually said in one place in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, woe to me if I don't share the good news with you. I mean, this is like having a cure to cancer, folks. If you discover a cure to cancer or to some other terrible disease, and you say, well, you know, I'm just going to keep this for me and my family. I'm not going to really share it with anybody. Shame on you. That's for the world. That's for the world. That's for everybody who suffers with this sickness, with this disease. Share it with everybody. And that's good news. It's, you call somebody up and say, hey, you know that problem you got? I got a fix for you. I got a fix for you. Oh, such good news. So the gospel, what is it? Well, it's the message of Jesus, the salvation of Jesus. He was sent from God. He was sent by God. He was sent as God to live in human flesh. And here are some points about the gospel. Here are some bullet points. He lived a sinless life. He was unjustly arrested and convicted. He was crucified on a cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He was resurrected on the third day. And today he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you and for me and all those who come to faith in him. And there are a lot more details about the gospel story. But that's the gospel in a nutshell. We could even summarize it shorter than that. And that's good news. And there's in these books called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Bible, where you can read more about his life and why it was so good to the people who were suffering and hurting and disappointed and hopeless in that time and in today's time. So that's what it is. The Gospel is the story of Jesus. That finally, there's hope for life now and life in the hereafter. Now don't let anybody steal this word. Don't let anybody take this word. You know, there have been, there have been tribes of churches who try to take this word and say, hey, oh no, we are preaching the gospel. You other churches, you're preaching something else. And you know, I take offense at that because actually there was a person who said that about our church, that we don't preach the gospel. And uh, I just wondered what kind of gospel she was listening to. Uh, you know, and so we, we preach the gospel about Jesus and about his message and his life and about the story of salvation for you. So that's what it is. Here's what it means. What it means is simply this. We're covered. 
We're covered. You ever had anybody tell you, hey, you said, hey, uh, I'm going to be going to be late. I'm, I'm not going to be able to, uh, you know, help out. Or, hey, don't, don't worry, my friend. We got you covered. We got you covered. That's a good word, isn't it, right there? We got you covered. Don't worry about it. You're covered. You don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to do this or that. We got you covered. That's what the gospel means. We're covered. Our past is covered. Our today is covered. Our future is covered. We're covered. Our sins are covered. Our shame is covered. And in the Bible, even before Jesus came along, that is, on the earth, Jesus has always existed. He's always been God. But before he came on the earth, there were foreshadowing pictures of the gospel in the Old Testament. Now, you and I have the benefit of living on this side of history. We have the gospel. We have the Bible. We have the story looking back on it. People in that day didn't have it, but what they were given was glimpses of what God was going to do for them when he sent his son Jesus to the earth. Now, they couldn't piece it together. The prophets were given that uncanny ability to kind of see things that other people couldn't see. But you and I have the benefit of looking back on Scripture and seeing these places where God was saying, look, I'm going to do this, and you're not going to know it, but it means I'm going to do this. And so the first one is in Genesis, after the fall of man. You remember the story in, the, in Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth and everything. He put everything in place, and, and, uh, and then he put man on the earth. And then he looked down at man. He said, boy, this guy he looks lonely. And uh, he, made, uh, he made a woman. You know, a, this was after he had brought all the animals to the man to see what he would name them, and the man did that. And this is the, this is the, the Genesis story. And maybe it's a little simplified. It, was, you know, it took a lot longer time and all these details that we don't have in the, in the biblical record. But that's what happened. And then when God looked at the man, he said, I, ne I need to make him uh, someone that corresponds to him. I need to make somebody like him. None of these animals correspond to him. I need to make a woman out of a man. And that's what God did. Well, you know the story. God had already given them freedom of choice. Just like Lucifer had freedom of choice when he rebelled against God and was kicked out of heaven. God doesn't do anything against your will. That's the beautiful thing that he gives us free will. And so Adam and Eve fell. They did what God told them not to do. They went somewhere God told them not to go. They ate something God said not to eat. And their eyes were indeed open. Now there's an interesting comment at the end of chapter 2 in Genesis that says, and, and you know, when I was younger I didn't really understand this. I'm like, why do they tell us this? But the end of chapter 2, and I don't have this on the screen, it says, and the man and the woman were naked and felt no shame. They were naked and felt no shame. Why, why would the writer tell us that? Okay. Because when they sinned, they were naked and they felt shame. They were naked and they felt shame because their eyes were open and they saw that, oh, we have rebelled against the holy God. We've rebelled against the holy God. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, the Bible says that God took one of those animals that Adam had named, that they knew, maybe they'd seen running through the garden, and God killed that animal, the first animal sacrifice, and, you know, this is a hunting season, so come on now, he skinned it out, and he made garments for them, to clothe them, so that they did not have to walk around naked in their shame. Knowing that it wasn't just a nakedness of body, it was a nakedness of soul that I have offended a creator, our God. So this is a beautiful picture of the gospel, isn't it? That where, where love, or where sin rather, and death expose and abuse, the gospel loves and covers. God says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this around you. There's so many pictures of that in theater and drama and movies and, and, uh, and in life where someone is cold or someone is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they've been assaulted or raped or something bad has happened to them. And, and figuratively or physically, someone comes and puts a blanket around them and says, it's okay. It's okay. I got you covered. I got you covered. That's such a beautiful picture of how life destroys us, abuses us, strips us. 
But God says, I'm going to cover you up. Now, something I didn't even mention in the first service, and I didn't even think of until just now, is that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was hanging naked. Symbolically, perhaps, saying, this is what it looks like. This is what sin looks like. It's like vulnerability. It's like, I can't help myself. I'm helpless. But this beautiful picture in Genesis, but that, that's not all. The picture is bigger than Genesis. It, it seeps on down into the rest of the Bible. In Exodus, you might remember when God's people were, his, uh, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God finally, you know, decided, hey, enough's enough, and he sent Moses. Remember, he sent Moses and his brother Aaron to go rescue them. And, and in order to soften up Pharaoh's hard heart, God sent these plagues to soften up Pharaoh's heart. And one of the plagues was the worst plague. It was the, it was the death angel killing the firstborn of every family in Egypt. It didn't matter where you were from or if you were Egyptian or Hebrew or whatever. Your firstborn was going to die, your firstborn son. So, but God said to the Israelites, he said, look, here's what I want you to do. Aaron, tell the, tell the children of Israel that here's what they need to do to protect themselves on this night when the death angel, that's what I'll call it, the death angel comes and strikes down the firstborn. I want them to sacrifice a lamb, an unblemished lamb, and take some of the blood of that lamb and smear it over the door, smear it over the door of their home, and when the death angel comes, he will see the blood of the lamb over their door, and he will pass over that door. And the Jews today celebrate the feast of the Passover because of that moment in history, in their history. The feast of the Passover is the remembrance that when God uh, was striking down the Egyptians, he, because of the blood of the Lamb, passed over the, uh, his people. He passed over. So where there would have been death, there is now life. And can't you see what a beautiful picture this was in Exodus, that this unblemished lamb and his blood would be applied to your door? When John saw Jesus, he was standing with his disciples, Jesus was walking by, he said, look, that's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's Jesus. And so he would become the lamb. He would become the murdered firstborn. Think about it. He was not only the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, he was the murdered firstborn whose blood would save us from our sins. That's a picture of the gospel. He has us covered. And God was giving them glimpses of, I'm, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. I, I know you're doing your best, but you're going to fall short, and I'm going to be there to cover the rest. Now, if you say, oh, God, you know, I, I, I know you're going to cover it. I'm just going to lay back here. No, no, that's not what the covering's about. The covering's are not about you being lazy and saying, oh, I'll just let God cover me. No. The covering's about you doing all you can do, understanding that you can't do near enough. Like, you may do this much, and he's going to do this much, but he wants you to do this much. He wants to see your heart, in other words. He wants to see your heart geared and aimed toward him. And he says, I got you covered. I love the picture in Psalm 91. Psalm 91, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. And listen to this image. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. Remember that old song, Under His Wings? I love that song. I'm about to sing it right now. Under His Wings. What a great song. What a great image of God who says, come closer, come closer. So I can cover you. Now I know the gospel makes a difference in your hereafter, but is it making a difference in your here and now? Are you sharing this message? Listen to this image as it continues on in the New Testament. In James chapter 5, Jesus' half-brother writes, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way or their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. There's that covering again. And now you have a part in it. You can 
take the gospel to someone else and say, hey, I know a fix for your problem. I know a solution to your, to your uh, issue there. I know a cure to your cancer, your cancer of sin. Here it is. I want to get you under the covering. But it's more than that. It's, it's, it's loving people, too. Proverbs says, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers all wrongs. And if we needed a message of love in our country today, in our lives today, it's now, isn't it? It's so easy to hate. It's so easy to get on sides, to draw sides, to, and to toss grenades at the other person, whether uh, Twitter wars or Facebook posts or some kind of uh, verbal or figurative fights against each other. It takes a little bit more to love, but the power of love is so much greater. And love covers over all wrongs. Peter picked this up. I think he was talking really to married couples, to families, to people who live close to each other. He said, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Let me tell you something. You can, you can stay mad at your husband or your wife or a family member. You can get your feelings hurt if you want to. And maybe there's issues we need to deal with there. But life's way too short and goes by way too fast for us not to love one another. And if you just love one another, if we just love one another, it, it'll help us to focus on the positive and just leave the negative. It's not my job to change you. And it's not your job to change me. But it is my job to pray for you. Lord, change her. No, maybe, Lord, change me. Whatever you want to pray is fine. Really, whatever you want to pray is fine. Just pray. God will do what he's going to do. He'll do what he's going to do. And it may be that the more you pray to change her, he's going to change you. But love covers over that. It's like, you know what? I know, I know he's got those faults, but I love him. I love him. I married him that way. He hasn't changed, but I love him. And somebody else may not love him like that, but you do. And, uh, and it covers it over. It covers it over just the way God loves you. And so uh, that's why I love the picture of baptism. Baptism is such a beautiful picture. Not only is it a reenactment of the gospel story, like the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And when we baptize someone, we put them all the way under. That's why we, by the way, that's why we immerse. That's the biblical meaning of baptism, and it is what baptism means to go all the way under. Well, when somebody dies, we don't sprinkle dirt on them. We put them six feet under, right? Yeah, so that's baptism. Romans chapter 6, if you want to read more about the picture of baptism, reenacting the gospel... Then read Romans chapter 6, the first several verses there. And uh, Paul says all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been buried with him. Or all of us who are in Christ have been buried with him in baptism. Whatever. Read that. But Galatians 3 has this idea. Galatians 3 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have what? Clothe yourselves with Christ. It kind of gets back to like Genesis 3. It's, it's kind of like putting on this jacket. I bought this jacket years ago. I don't even remember where, but it's my favorite jacket. And uh, if you've, if you've, I've seen pictures of me in this jacket from like 15 years ago. I'm like, what are you still doing that with that jacket? But I love this jacket. I can't even put things in the pocket because it's, it's got holes all in it. But when I have this jacket on, it, I feel good in this jacket. I just like it. I don't know why. This is kind of like what God does for me. He covers me. And so now, when you see me, you see this jacket. You may like it or hate it, I don't know, but it's, it's, I'm covered with it, right? And so my life is not really about me. It, it, 
when I'm covered by Jesus, my life now is about him. So you might see some of my life, but what I want you to see is what I'm covered with. I'm, I'm covered, so it's not about money. I, want, I don't want you to see necessarily the bad things I do with my money. Not that I do bad things, but I want you to see how he, he covers me with my money. My marriage. You know, you can you could know some bad things about me in my marriage. I mean, not really bad, but you know, just bad enough. But I don't want you to see that. I want you to, I want you to see how he covers me in my marriage. And my kids, and my parenting, and now my grandparenting. I, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be perfect as a preacher. As a preacher, you know, you might say, oh, well, I've got 15 things I can tell you you've done wrong in the last 10 years or last week or whatever. I, I know that. I know that. But what I want you to see is the covering that I have. I'm, st I'm still covered. Preachers are people too. We're covered. We're covered. But you know, he's not going to force you to put, put him on. He won't force you to put him on. If you want, you, you can not put him on at all. Matter of fact, you know, he doesn't... He doesn't force anybody to put him on. If you want, you can just, well, you can just leave him hanging, I guess. If you want, you can, you can just leave him hanging. And then you won't be covered. And then you, you're going to be walking around in your shame and your sin. But I want you to be covered. Would you stand up with me right now? I want to pray for you. The gospel is such a powerful, powerful story we have. Let's pray about it. Lord, thank you so much for the gospel. More than that, for the, the one about whom the gospel is written, about Jesus, about his life, his death, his burial and resurrection, and about his power over death and sin that comes down to us when we trust him. I pray, God, that we would all find our shelter in the gospel. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you've never been baptized. I want to invite you to do that today. Get this covering in your life. Get this covering. If you've trusted him, if you believe in him, if you know that he is the one who died for you, then I'll ask you what the Apostle Paul was asked. What stops you? What stops you? Get up, be baptized. And so that's my appeal to you today. If you've never done that, I'd love to do it today. We can do it now. We can do it this afternoon. We can do it tonight. And maybe you've done that, but you, you, you're kind of drifting out there. Maybe you want to come forward and say, hey, I want to put some roots down. I want to be a part of uh, this body, this church, so that I can help others know of this covering. If you need prayer, you come as we sing.